I am super honored uh, to be here with you guys. I, I don't take it lightly uh, when Rob asked me to preach, um, and I'm just super excited uh, for the word that God has uh, placed uh, on my heart for tonight. And, and I've, I've kind of realized uh, going throughout the week uh, that this message was exactly kind of what, what God had been intending for all, all week. I, I've had many conversations with you, uh, some of you in the crowd, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to give away what we've talked about, because then it would give away my message. But uh, I, I'm just super excited, because I really feel like the Lord uh, wants to say something to each and every one of you tonight. Uh, but before I go on, um, I, I, today's a special day. Um, I'm not a dad, uh, but I have a dad. Um, so I, I really want to honor uh, the, the dads in the room, and I specifically want to honor my dad and my grandfather, who uh, my grandfather came all the way from Florida to hear me talk. Yeah, I, clap it up. Uh, but I, I don't know why he would do that. He's heard me talk for 23 years, um, and now he wants to hear me talk for 30 minutes straight. Um, thank you. Um, but I, I just really want to pray, pray a blessing over uh, uh, the fathers in the room, uh, and then we'll kind of kick right in. Cool? Awesome. Uh, God, I, I'm just so thankful for the men that you have uh, placed in my life, um, just, just the men that, that have been awesome examples of, of, of what a man looks like. God, I, I want to thank you not just for, for my dad and my grandfather, but the spiritual fathers that you have placed over my life. God, I, I thank you for every father that's sitting in this room, Lord. I pray that they would be celebrated and honored uh, today, God, that, that, that they would uh, just know that you love them so deeply. And for those of us who are sitting in this room who uh, maybe you don't have a, a great relationship with your father, or maybe uh, there's some pain there, I, I just pray, Jesus, that you would come and you would console. God, you would meet each person exactly where they are. And God, I pray you would do the same thing with this message, God. I pray that you would split it apart into a thousand pieces uh, so that uh, it, it would hit each and every one of us in a really distinct way. So Jesus, uh, we thank you, and it is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are in the middle of our uh, Backwards Gospel series, and there are some new faces in the crowd. Uh, so I just want to say you should definitely go into our Spotify, YouTube, and go watch the past sermons. I mean, they have challenged us as a staff. I know that they've challenged you as a community. So I would really kind of, to, to get the full context of what I'm talking about tonight, please go and listen. But Rob has done a really great job at kind of giving a backdrop to what exactly uh, Galatians is about. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit of that as well. So Paul is responding to a letter uh, that he got from a church out in Galatia, and, and he's, he's kind of frustrated. He's frustrated because these Galatians have uh, received what, what he would kind of, what, what we have termed as the backwards gospel. You see, he's, he's frustrated because they, these Galatians were told, hey, believing in Jesus isn't enough. There's actually more that you need to do. You are not saved just by your faith in Jesus. There's, there's a lot more to it. And Rob, uh, and I think it was the first week, gave us a point. Uh, don't put an asterisk where Jesus has placed a period. Right? And, and what that was in reference to is, hey, don't add things to the gospel that never intended to be there. So what was happening was these Galatians were being told that they had to follow a specific law, that they had to follow Mosaic law in order to fully uh, have faith in, in who Jesus was and for Jesus to save them. And I'm super excited because we're, we're picking up uh, in, in Galatians 4 after Rob had spoke last week about what it really looked like for us to be freed from our sins. Uh, so uh, tonight I'm, I'm titling uh, kind of this sermon, if you're taking notes, uh, Child of the Promise. Cool? Cool. Uh, so we're going to pick up in Galatians 4. If you don't have a Bible, as Rob likes to coin it, it'll be on the air Bible behind me. Um, I'll be reading off of my screen. Um, but yeah, let's jump in. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, 
you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? I really want to focus on the first half of this piece of scripture. So Paul talks about a child being no better than a slave, even though he was to receive the full inheritance of the land. He says that the child must be under direct orders and learning from tutors and administrators. In these first few verses, Paul is is really kind of trying to explain to the Galatians what the law was. And as I was reading a commentary, it, it, it explained the law as kind of a strict teacher that was guiding uh, the Israelites. So the law was meant to kind of be a a guiding force. I don't know about you, um, I I remember being in sixth grade through seventh and eighth grade. Uh, I had a wonderful teacher, Uh, her name was Miss Hazeltine, and man, she had it out for me. She was real strict, guys, real strict. Like she would call me out for everything, and she, rightfully so, um, I was a lazy student and she saw it, So she would call me out every single time. Uh, Even so much so, I still remember sitting in her class and I sat like, the door was right in front of me. Why she placed me in the door, I don't know. Um, But I was typically friends with females and these females walked by and they were like, hi, Andre. And Mrs. Hazeltine was like, no, figures it would be you. And I was like, bro, I'm not even doing anything. Like, I'm just sitting here. What do you mean? But the reality is, is that probably you've had some of those, and it almost seems impossible, right, to, to please that person. It seems impossible to, to even like, like, man, I'm doing my best, but I'm just not meeting the standard that you've set for me. And that's somewhat of how, how the guidelines felt, but, but Jesus comes in, right? Jesus comes in, and, and he, he's doing something new. Jesus comes in, and he lives under the law, and he's the only one to ever do it perfectly, And he does that in order to free us from the consequences of us getting it wrong. You see, he dies this undeserving death. He pays the price of sin, but he never committed any sin. And he does it because he knew that we would never be able to follow it to a T. Our first main point that that I've focused on is, man, Jesus' death and resurrection means that we are set free from this performance mentality to relationship mentality. When Paul is explaining to the Christians that he's writing to, what, what he's trying to explain is he knew that God, that, that God knew that we would not be able to, to kind of follow this law perfectly. So he sends Jesus in order to create a relationship between us. He knew that, 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 that the law would eventually end up kind of creating this slave and master uh, dichotomy. This relationship between one person and another. And as I looked into uh, what, what this meant, I, I immediately jumped to slavery in our own kind of civil war mindset, right? This brutal, demonic slavery. But, but what's really beautiful is the New Testament, it, slavery didn't look like this. So slaves were typically called bond servants, and they would willingly enter into uh, kind of a relationship where they were indebted to this person, so they knew that they would serve this person. And while serving this person, they knew that they would be taken care of, that, that they really wouldn't have to worry about kind of food or, or what was going to happen to them. But the reality was, was they, they were still in debt to this person. They weren't working out of a loving relationship. They weren't working to, to try and, and uh, to, to just be with that person. They were working in order to pay off a very large debt, and they would end up working for years, performing for this master. But under sonship, things change. You see, under sonship, we, we do things out of, the lo- out of our love for the Father and the love that the Father has for us. We follow and live for and with Jesus because of the freedom he has brought us. He, rele- he releases us from the chains that once bound us. We love Christ because he loved us first. You see, this isn't a performance-based love, but rather we are living out of the freedom and overflow of Jesus' love for us. And man, there is a large debt. There is a large debt that you have to pay. But that's not what he expects from you. And he's never expected that from you. As I've thought through this week, 
of who am I? Am I the bond servant or am I a son? I've got to be honest with you. I'm typically the bond servant. Now, this probably two people over here get super excited about this, maybe more. Um, on the Enneagram, which is a personality test, yes, I am a type two. A type two is a helper. Um, and what I like about the Enneagram is it, it tells you, I, I have a sick mind, it tells you what your basic fear is. Like your like, most basic fear. And that basic fear is that I constantly feel like I'm unloved. I'm constantly fearing that people don't actually love me. So what do I do? I perform. I serve. And, and uh, as, when I started following Jesus, man, this became so apparent to me because I was trying to win his affection so hard. You see, when I started following Jesus more intentionally, I was in college, um, and I started off going to one Bible study, then two Bible studies, then three Bible studies, four Bible studies, five Bible studies. Then I led a Bible study. Um, I became a leader. I discipled three to five people a week, which was about an hour a week. Then I sat down with our leaders, um, and I probably discipled about two or three of our leaders. Um, I was the president of our organization. I still got my schoolwork done. Um, try to be a good son, talk to my parents. Uh, try to be a good brother, talk to my siblings. Try to be a good friend. Try to be a good Jesus follower. Man, at one point, it, it, it got me. Halloween of, I believe it was my sophomore, sophomore junior year, uh, we used to do this thing called Halloween for the Homeless. We would go out and we would uh, collect canned goods from rich neighborhoods. Uh, we would bring them to this local nonprofit. They would hand out those canned goods to uh, uh, families who were in need. And I got a text in the middle of one of my hardest classes that said, hey, Andre, you're cool to um, organize everything and make sure that people leave from the school, people like spread out, um, you know, just put people in cars. And if, I already start stressing out, like, oh my God, what, what am I gonna do? Like, that's so many people. What, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? So I get there and people are like, so where do we go? Who do I put in my car? Should we go yet? I'm like, I, do you have people in your car? Yeah, so go. <laughs> um, but, but this literally took about 30 minutes. Finally, I'm, in the, I'm the last car to leave. I drop off four people. And I remember pulling into a parking lot after dropping them off and bawling my eyes out. Man, I, I, I realized at that moment, and I cried out to Jesus. I said, Jesus, I can't do anything to win your affection or love. I don't feel it, and I'm trying so hard. So the next day, I was brought into a, a meeting with uh, one of my staff workers, and I told her everything, and, and a Camara sat across from me, and she said, you know, Andre, if you stop doing ministry, do you know that Jesus would love you the same? Do you know that if you literally stop doing everything that you think you have to do, Jesus would love you no different? And that baffled me. That hit me so hard. And as I've looked in scripture, I've tried to find places where Jesus is like, hey, try harder so I can love you. Where God is like, hey, just do a little bit more and you've got my seal of approval. And the reality is, is I can't find that anywhere. But that's exactly what was being communicated to the Christians in Galatia. But Jesus is saying the complete opposite. You see, even in this piece of scripture that we're looking at in Galatians, we, we are told God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you an heir. You see, Jesus was born under this performance mentality. He knew what that looked like and what it felt like to live under it. So again, he, he died on the cross, breaking the veil between you and God, forever changing your relationship with God and with him. Can I, can I, can I break some lies off of you that, that mentality or performance mentality has placed on you? Thanks, Dev. <laughs> Guys, Jesus doesn't need your A-plus on your test. He doesn't need your perfect relationship, your aesthetically pleasing Instagram. He doesn't need your six-figure salary. He doesn't need your gym body. And he sure as heck doesn't need your false humility. And he doesn't need your Sunday best. In a relationship mentality, Jesus tells us that he wants one thing, one thing. He wants you. That's all he's ever wanted. 
He wants you to pull aside from the hustle and bustle of this world to sit with him. And as I've thought about moments where, where Jesus has like really commended people for, for sitting with him and following him, and it's always happened when people were close, when people were near him. And I, I ended up in Luke 10 reading about Martha and Mary. And again, as a two, I am Martha. That is who I am. I serve. So Martha, Jesus is, in uh, Jesus is in Martha and Mary's house, and Martha is like going around cleaning everything, 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 because Jesus is there. So like, you got to make sure everything's pristine, everything looks nice. And where's Mary? Martha tells you, she's like, Jesus, tell this girl to get up, because she need to clean something in this house. <laughs> and Jesus is like, Martha, I, I love that you're cleaning, and, and I, I love your heart behind this. But man, Mary is doing the better thing. Mary is just sitting at my feet. And she is loving and she is worshiping me. But for us in New England, well, that's not our culture. You see, our culture is go, 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 go. Oh, you can't go anymore? Hmm, you should probably go further. There's no rest. There is no rest. We have the awesome opportunity living in Fairfield County to be so close to New York and kind of close to Boston where that, that's just their life. They're constantly going. But man, it gets exhausting, doesn't it? At some point, you need a release from the stress. And I want to be honest with you and be like, man, I just, after a really hard day, I go and I open my Bible and just, Lord, speak to me now, please. But the reality is, is I can't wait to get in bed. I can't wait to turn on Netflix. I go to the mall to just walk around Target for no reason. I got that from my mom. Um, I literally, literally just walk around, and I'm like, oh, that'd be nice. Wow, that would look great on me. <laughs> Why? I don't know what it's serving, but it serves as a release. I find myself giving into temptation and seeking anything that would give me an immediate release from that stress. Anything that would keep me from Jesus, anything that would give me just direct and immediate pleasure. But what I've learned is in those things, we, we start to find comfort. But the things that are comfortable to us, they're not actually freedom. The things that are comfortable to us, they don't bring any freedom to us. Rather, risk in, in letting go of whatever's bothering us does. So our next point is comfort is not freedom. Risk with Jesus is. We're going to head back into our passage Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Man, these Christians were running back to the very things that once enslaved them. They they were going back to what was comfortable, kind of like the Israelites who would go back and would worship a god that might bring them immediate release, immediate stress release because God wasn't bringing the rain, so they might as well pray to a God that brought the rain. And Paul, Paul in his frustration, he questions their logic, and I don't know if you have been in this place before, but I surely have. I, I believe that Paul is like that friend that, know, that he, he really knows what's best for you or she really knows what's best for you, and that ex is trying to come back into your life, right? And you're like, ah, man, like, I really want to talk to her. Like, dude, she was so great. Like, I love it. And Paul is literally like, why would you do that? Do you remember the last time we were here and you were crying about how much they sucked because they didn't give you what you wanted or what you needed? What are you doing? Oh, that didn't hurt y'all. That hurt me. (laughs) He reminds them, didn't God already set you free from this? I'm going to invite Dom onto the stage. You see, before I knew Jesus, I was a slave, and I lived under the slavery of different idols. These chains represent me idolizing the culture that I was around. I was a slave to my insecurities, And man, I found my worth in any woman that would give me attention. I found my worth in whether or not my family was proud of me, 
what they thought of me. I allowed myself to become addicted to sexual sin. My chains became the very thing that I was comfortable with. I left my water bottle over there. It's okay. I'll walk over there. (laughs) But guys, this becomes so easy, right? We become comfortable in our own sin. The very things that I probably couldn't do, I can still do them. But after a while, it gets a little bit harder. You see, the reality is, is I like to lift my hands when I worship. I can't do that. I like to serve God, right? I, 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 that's who I am. I love to serve people. But I, I, how? I can't do that. This is my identity. This is your identity. This is maybe where some of you are. But I want to remind you that Jesus came to set you free. These chains were not meant for you to put back on. He never intended for you to put these back on. You see, Jesus came with a different way and a better way. One that doesn't come with the reminder of shame and condemnation. Our last point for tonight is that you are a child of the promise. Galatians 4 ends saying, Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Now, Paul writes this in reference to a story that maybe many of you are familiar with. But he's talking about when Abraham was promised that he would have a son. Actually, that he would have generations and generations that would come from him. But Abraham was old, and he was dusty. So was his wife. So Sarah, out of her insecurity, out of her not knowing whether or not God was going to come through on his promise, tells Abraham, hey, why don't you go and why don't you sleep with with Hagar? Why don't you sleep with her and have a child with her? So Abraham does. Don't listen to women. They get you in trouble. Men, just throwing it out there. So Abraham does and he gets Hagar pregnant. Soon after, Sarah becomes pregnant. And Sarah begins to be very insecure of uh, of Abraham's relationship with Ishmael. And I believe that there are so many sins that we think, "Well, well, it's not that bad. My greed's not that bad. My sexual sin's not that bad. I I do whatever I want. But the reality is, at some point, some of you will enter into a relationship and it will be uncomfortable to have to explain, well, I did X and Y and Z with this person. And, and, and there becomes a, a kind of like, like man, why, why, did, why didn't you just wait? God promised you something. Why didn't you just wait? Same thing with your greed. Same thing with that job that you, you thought, hey, that would be really great. I love that job. It's paying me more. But God said, that's not the one I have for you. So then when you're dealing with the stress of, of the job that Jesus told you not to take, at no point Do you come to think, well, wait, that's because I I went ahead of the promise. And that's exactly uh, what what, uh, Paul is trying to say here. Hey, you are children of promise. God has promised you something. And and if you go through the Bible, God has actually promised you many things. But I'm going to focus on one thing today. In 1 Chronicles, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their, heal their land. Guys, it's, it's, it's their choice. If my people do this, I promise them this. If you will humble yourself, if you will pray, seek his face, turn from your wicked ways, he will forgive you. He will heal you. Dan, if you wouldn't mind coming up. What I've learned is as Jesus has released me from these chains, from these very chains that I I hold in my hand, 
man, I hold on to them tighter and tighter. Like I said, these are things that I've, come, I've become comfortable with. These are things that I know. See, I love my insecurities. I know that that sounds weird, but it's so much easier to be insecure. It's so much easier to fall into sexual sin. So I hold on to these tight. Jesus, you, you can't take these back. We, we tend to put them on ourselves. You see, I, I was thinking last week when Rob was talking about our freedom from sin, I was thinking about, well, wait, what happens when Wednesday comes? Because it's really easy, right, on, on Sunday to walk out of here and be jazzed. Man, Jesus bless me. Jesus is good. When you hear a message from Rob and you're like, man, I feel inspired. But then you wake up the next morning and you get bad news. And then on Tuesday, your girlfriend breaks up with you. And then on Wednesday, your boss pulls you into a meeting to tell you how poorly you're doing at your job. And my first reaction is, let me put these back on because they're exactly who I am. But what happened to Sunday? What happened to Sunday? What happened to every promise that you heard? Man, we have to root ourselves in, ourselves in Jesus. We have to be able to give these and leave them. Leave them. Put them at the cross and say, those don't belong to me anymore. Because Jesus has taken them. And as I've thought about what, it, what that looks like, I've thought about a story that Jesus, it, it, God and I have been just processing through for the past six months. It's the story of the prodigal son. This isn't a point for those of you who have been in church for a long time to check out, because you know the story. It's not. This is a story of, of, a, of a young man who thought that he knew better, so he went to his father and he said, hey dad, give me the inheritance. It's time for me to go. I've got better things to do. And he leaves and he goes to kind of the equivalent of what we would call Las Vegas. And he spends all of his money. He ends up in a pig pen. That's where he was working. That's where he got his food. And while he's in there, he, he begins to think about his dad and, and his servants, his, his dad's servants. And he's like, man, my, my dad's servants never were hungry because my dad always had bread for them. Maybe my dad would take me back. Maybe he would take me back as his servant because I don't deserve to be his son. So he prepares that speech and he's ready to go and that's what we're gonna pick up. It says, and he rose and came to the, his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And here's the son's speech, he's ready. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, the father didn't care about the speech. The father doesn't care about your speech. The father doesn't care that you want to come back and be a hired servant. He looks at you and he says, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate, for this my son was dead and is, al uh, and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Will you stand with me? You and I off, too often have come to God with our prepared speeches. Too often we've come to God saying, if only you would accept me back as a servant. I promise I'll make up for the debt you paid. But Jesus is interrupting you tonight. Tonight Jesus is saying, I, I just want to put you in the best robe and I, I want to give you the finest jewelry because you are my child and I, I love you so much. Tonight I pray that you would leave the chains you have become so comfortable with. Leave them at Jesus' feet as the Father loves you so deeply. And before the foundations of this world were created, he knew you. He has called you his beloved. He calls you his prince and his princess. 
I pray that you would receive that today. Allow his presence to wash over you as you worship. Allow his grace to unlock those chains. Don't pick them back up. Don't. Let's bow our head and pray. Jesus, we are so indebted to you. Lord, there is nothing that I could ever do. There is nothing that we could ever do to win your affection or love. But I am so grateful that you pour it out anyways, Jesus. Lord, that you, you, you give it to us anyways. That there is nothing that we could do that would make you love us more because you already love us to the max. God, I pray that as we worship, Lord, that you would take off every chain. God, that you would bury it deep under the ground at the foot of your cross. God, I pray that into our Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Lord, that you would remind us of, our prom- of the promise that you gave us, that you forgave us and that you've healed us. So Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.